Today we're going to take a look at our last group of vertebrate animals, which are mammals. And you should have this page of notes to follow along in this lesson. As you know from yesterday's scavenger hunt, there is a wide variety of mammals and they're pretty fascinating to study. There's actually 26 different groups of mammals. I'm just going to highlight nine of them for you today. Um, the first group is rodents, which are the ones that have nine teeth. So that includes not only squirrels and mice, but also chipmunks, rats, prairie dogs, and beavers. So these are mainly herbivores that chew on branches or plants. And so those teeth constantly grow throughout their lives because as they gnaw on things, they constantly rub those teeth down. The second group is our canines, which of course, of course includes dogs and wolves and also coyotes and foxes. Our third group is the feline category. So that includes your domesticated cats, your pets, as well as a wide variety of wild um, cats as well, including lions, link lynxes, cougars, tigers, leopards, jaguars, and cheetahs. Our fourth group here is called the marsupials. And marsupials are characterized as mammals that have a pouch that they carry their baby in. So probably the most famous example of that is a kangaroo. Koalas also have that pouch, as well as opossums and wombats. And that pouch holds the baby when it is not fully developed. Um, so usually these babies are born not ready to survive on their own. They crawl into the mother's pouch and the mother carries them around in that pouch for six months up to a year um, while the baby continues to grow in that protected part of its mother's body. Our fifth group here is the bats. They are the only flying mammals. The sixth group is a very large group, um, both in how many different kinds of animals are in this group and also in the size of this. The ungulates are all of our mammals that have hooves to them. So that includes your horse and your deer, and yes, even rhinos and hippos. Pigs, ox, goat, and bison are also part of this group, as well as giraffes and camels. Our seventh group is called the cetaceans. And cetaceans are basically all the mammals that live in the ocean, entirely in the ocean. So that would include our dolphins, as well as our whales, and also porpoises. The eighth group is called the monotremes. And monotremes are unique from other mammals in that they actually reproduce by laying eggs. So the main one you've probably heard of before is the duck-billed platypus. And then another type of animal we'll see a picture of later is called a spiny anteater or akinda. And then the ninth group I want to point out to you is called primates. Primates are known for having a posable thumb. So in other words, their thumb is separately, um, it faces separately from the rest of their fingers. And that allows them to be able to grip um, and change the way that they hold things in their hands. So they are a lot more flexible in what they're able to do and hold on to and move. Um, that includes lemurs, gorillas, apes, orangutans, lemurs, I said that twice, <laughs> baboons, and monkeys. Now that we've seen some examples, let's take a look at some of the characteristics of mammals. They are known as warm-blooded, or we also call them endothermic. And that means that their body temperature is higher than that of their environment. So they use up energy keeping a higher um, body temperature than their environment. Um, humans, of course, are considered a type of mammal in part because we have a constant body temperature, which is usually 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or in Celsius, 37 degrees Celsius. Um, I should note that when you are sick, your body intentionally creates a fever because that's one of the ways that your body is trying to kill off whatever it is that's infecting it. So higher body temperature will kill off certain types of bacteria. And so when you are sick, your body on purpose raises your temperature to help kill those off. And again, that's because we're able to regulate our body temperature. There are a couple exceptions to having a body temperature higher than its environment. Um, newborn mammals often are not yet able to regulate their body temperature. Um, so that's one of the reasons why they have to stay close to their mother, um, particularly until their fur grows in. Also mammals that are undergoing hibernation um, lower their body temperature to conserve energy. Um, and then torpor is another example. This is a short-term hibernation, so not like the long multiple months, but a couple hours a day if they're short on food or the temperatures are lower. 
Some mammals, particularly rodents and marsupials, will lower, enter into the state of torpor, where they just lower their body temperature and rest for shorter periods. All mammals do breathe with lungs, and that makes it easier for us to understand why whales and dolphins fit into the mammal category, because though they really do have fins and they look kind of more like fish and they spend their lives in the ocean, um, they do actually have lungs. In fact, the lung of a whale, it holds 13,000 gallons of air. As I said, most, as you know, most um, mammals do live on land, but whales and dolphins live entirely in the ocean. Mammals are covered with hair or fur, um, and you might be thinking, huh, some of them like a dolphin, does that really have hair? Well, yeah, actually it does. Um, dolphins have little teeny tiny hair follicles that are around their nose, so this is a micros like a microscope view of the hair follicle of a dolphin and a whale, so yes, even they have body hair. What sets mammals apart from other animals that we've studied so far is that most of them have live births, meaning that the babies develop inside the mother's body and then when they are born, they're born alive, as opposed to all the other animals we've studied that reproduce with eggs. Um, we have two main types of mammals that have an exception to that, that is the platypus over here laying eggs, and then also as I mentioned, another monotreme is the spiny anteater, which is also called an akinda. I should also mention with re reproduction, we've talked about in the reproduction um, strategies of animals that some animals will lay a whole lot of eggs and then swim, swim away. And so the chances of survival for any one of those eggs when it hatches is very small, but because they've laid millions of eggs, there are still gonna be some that are survived to adulthood. And that's usually the way that simpler organisms reproduce. When we get to mammals, mammals take the second reproductive strategy, which is that they only give birth to a couple at a time, but then they take very close care of their babies. The babies stay with their mothers for months, if not years, until they're fully able to live out on their own. So though mammals have fewer babies at a time, they do take better care of them. So the chances of survival are much higher for each of those young. A couple other facts about mammals is that most of the mothers have mammary glands, and that actually is where the word mammal comes from. And those glands are basically a modified sweat gland um, that allows the mother to produce milk that is used to feed their babies. Um, so you can see two examples of that here. And of course, when we're drinking cow's milk, um, it is only a cow that has given birth to a baby and only one that is a mother. So has to be female, has to have given birth in order for a cow to be able to produce milk. And also, as I mentioned, mammals are considered the most sophisticated of all of God's creation. And so they are considered, in general, there are certainly exceptions, as the most intelligent animals. Now that we've looked at all the characteristics of mammals, go ahead and complete the crossword puzzle using what you've learned.